Hey, hello, IB Biology. This is Mr. McGee. This is for our lab we did on exploring the function of enzymes. Today, we're going to make a graph and a table, and we're going to do statistical analysis, and I'll show you how to set up your experiment. I'm going to do this really quickly because a lot of you can just skip ahead right to the steps you want to test here, so you can always rewind and go back to the part that you need to. So I am going to speak fast, so just kind of bear with me, and I'll do this as quick as I can. First of all, let me go ahead and blow the screen up here so you can see it. You can go over here to view and blow this up. I'll blow it up to right about there so it's a little easier to see our data. You'll notice that we have our three independent variables. Always on your graph, put your independent variables to the side and your dependent variables in another box. But our dependent variables are our measurements. So notice we have many trials. I actually have the first block in the yellow and the second block in the green. And we always, always have to get an average of our trials. And then we need to know how much they are spread out. That is our standard deviation. Now notice group uh, first block, the group table seven, they had two samples they did not get. But that does not affect our results because we're going to get an average and it's not going to really affect it all that much. So even though you may have gaps, it is completely fine. Again, notice here we've got the uncertainty placed after this section right here, and I'm accurate to within two millimeter or two milliliters. And that is because we were talking that the foam from all the soap in that was hard to get an accurate flat level. So we said, let's knock it up maybe two or maybe five milliliters. It's up to you, the scientist. All right, so let's go ahead and finish the rest of this table here. So you have to do nothing there. First thing we're gonna have to do is go ahead and calculate the mean. So to go ahead and calculate the mean, you just click in the cell you wanna calculate and type in equals, and then you're gonna type in average. Now notice it starts to pop up a suggestion. So I'm gonna click the average and make sure it tells you the raw data, B3 to M3. In this case, B3 to M3 is right there. Those are the raw data. So I'm gonna go ahead and click enter, that is correct. Now the computer thinks, hey, I got the hang of this and it wants to fill in these two. You can go ahead and click on that. Just make sure you click on these data cells and make sure that B4, M4 is that corresponding row. And then this one should be B5 through M5, which it was reporting up over here. You can see what that equation is. So that is good to go. Now, if you remember, we want to round these to the lowest number of sig figs because we are the lowest number of decimal points. So we would go up here to the rounding section up there and we're going to go ahead and hit this one and that'll reduce our decimal places and round that to a whole number. Now, if you also recall, there is an exception to this rule, and that is often we can add a degree of precision, especially when we're doing a mean. So we're going to go ahead and add an extra decimal place to these. Now, we'll go to the standard deviation section over here. And if you look at this one, standard deviation, to do this, we're going to have to type in equals for an equation, stdev. And once again, it pops up a suggestion. Go ahead and click stdev. And you'll notice it pops in, it's ready for us to input our values. Here we gotta go and highlight our raw data. Go ahead and click and highlight just the data. Be careful not to highlight the mean, that is not part of your data. And so once you get B3 through M3, you go ahead and click enter and it should give you that. And once again, it's picking an autofill. That's kind of nice because you don't have to do it for each and every single row, it's automatically taking a guess. Now standard deviation, we don't use decimal points, we use sig figs. So I'll look at my sig figs here and it looks like the lowest amount of sig figs I can see is we have one sig fig, sig fig here with 70 and uh, we have two sig figs with 15. I'm gonna go ahead and round it down to one, whoops, round it down to one sig fig here if you can see where the rounding is. But if you notice, it's a whole number and in these cases, like I said, sometimes it's nice to just add an extra decimal place of precision. So if we do later math, okay? There we go, you've now completed your table. And then to go ahead and finish this, what you're gonna do at this time is you can highlight your table and you go ahead and click copy. And then we're gonna come here to your assignment. You can paste your table right here. You can go here like pasting like this and you can click paste on linked, it doesn't matter. And there's your table. Now, if you notice the table is really messed up and this is gonna leave you a couple options here. You can play with this format by highlighting this here and reducing the size and that'll try to get it to fit in there nice and neatly. And that may require you having to come in here and get these to shrink the font size so you can get those to fit nice and neat as well. And you can come over here to, uh, whoops, to get these nice and centered. And we can even go to a section here to get it, uh, where is it at? There's some of these bars you can play with here and it'll actually move it and shift it to where they're nice and centered in there. But I'm not gonna do that all for right now. So you can do that as one option, just paste your table like this. 
Or another option you can do, especially if you have a Windows PC, is you can simply come up here and you can use a snipping tool like this. I use this on my Windows PC where I use a snipping tool and go click New. And then I come over here and very carefully, I'm gonna do this crudely right now, just go and highlight everything like this and then snip out the image, go ahead and copy it. And now I can just paste this as an image. And what's nice about this is it lets me resize the image to fit my screen like this. And you wanna get it in a way where the data is nice and visible. And you can always come up here too to move it over like this and then get it even more blown up. But the key is you want your data to be visible and nice and presentable too. And if you're really obsessed with a border, you can always come up here and add a border too. So wherever that key is, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time looking for stuff right now. So let me just go ahead. Uh, border is not hard to find. It's just one of those things right now I'm not gonna deal with at the moment. So we have our uh, table pasted right there. Now let's go ahead and complete our graph. I'm gonna go over here. To complete our graph, it's a little bit more tricky. We need to tell the computer what is our X and Y axis. To do this here is your independent variable and then our dependent or our independent variable is going to be our x-axis our dependent variable the mean is going to be our y-axis but our, the computer is not going to be able to know what to do with all these trials so what we're going to do is we're going to put them down here i'm going to go ahead and copy the independent variable data points and i'm going to copy my dependent variable data points here like this whoops and notice it's trying to paste the equations and the computer doesn't know what to do with those. So I'm going to go here, paste special and just the values only. Otherwise, it's just trying to paste the equations there. And let's go ahead and round down to those two because we don't want to have numbers like that, even though it's not a big deal. OK, so we can go ahead and make a graph like this here. Um, the, and it would make a bar graph if I was to go here and insert a chart. We should get a bar graph that's made from this. Here's a pie chart. Let's go ahead and try to get a... Let's try to get a bar graph out of this of some sort. And there we go, it works. The problem is this bar graph does not allow us to put in error bars. And so you can see if I shrink it down just a little bit, it's a nice bar graph, but we need to be able to do more with it. We need to add our error bars for our standard deviation. And so this bar graph is not gonna work. We're gonna have to clear it out. That means we have to do a trick. And I apologize for this next step. It is a little confusing and that is because Google Sheets is annoying. To do this, we have to trick the computer into thinking each column is its own bar graph. And to do that, well, there really is no easy, whoops, there really is no easy way to do it. You just have to move these over into their own column. That way, each independent variable and dependent variable average is in its own category. And again, that is annoying, but that is the way it is. Now, if we go ahead and graph all these, you just highlight the whole thing and you come up here to insert chart, you should get a graph that looks somewhat like this. Same thing as we had before, but they're colored, and that's because it isolates all the numbers as their own. I'm gonna go back over here and blow this up to 100 just to make this a little easier to see, and I'm gonna go ahead and, whoops, click and move this over here just so we can do a few more things. Now what we have left to do is we need to create our error bars. We need to know what the spread is of our standard deviation. For example, we look at the first one here. Well, that's nice that it's this average, but was the data consistent? And according to our standard deviation, they were uh, relatively consistent, but the most consistent was this bottom one. And so we need to reflect this in our error bars. Go ahead and double click on there just to get this. What you're gonna do to do this is you go to customize your chart, okay? To do the custom, we're gonna go over here to series and you just have to follow through with me. A series, under customize is essentially each column here, which is what each of these columns is. What we're gonna do is add an error bar to each series. Go over here and just do column one, the blue one, and we're gonna then scroll down and go here to error bars, and we're gonna then go to constant. This is annoying, like I said. And we're gonna enter a value, which is our standard deviation. The answer is 4.5, okay? Go ahead and hit enter, and look what it did. It punched in our error bar there. Now we're gonna go back up again to series, but do column two, and now we're gonna do error bar and constant, and we're gonna enter 6.3. That is for the, uh, the middle error bar. And we're gonna do the last one, and I'm sure you've kind of picked it up at this point here. Do the error bar, make sure it is constant. That is a set number, again, this is annoying. And there you go. You now have created your error bars, and that shows the spread of the data. 
Hey, the last thing we need to do, at least here, first of all, I would recommend clicking the legend, this color code. We do not need that. Just click on there and go to none. We don't really need the legend because it's already labeled at the bottom. It just kind of clutters up your graph. We now need to label our axes. Now at the bottom here, we don't really need to label it because it already is labeled, but these numbers to the side, they do need to be labeled. So go over here to chart and axis titles and click vertical axis title. That's going to put a title off to the side here. And we're going to click, and if you guess what it is, it is exactly what is here, the dependent variable. The height of the reaction, make sure you put a parentheses, plus or minus. You can do Alt-0177 if you were on a Windows computer, or you can just do plus slash minus. Um, I don't know what a Chromebook, if it has a special code or not. Plus slash minus, and we said two milliliters. Okay, that tells our precision. Go ahead and click enter, and voila, you can see it is off to the side there like that. You can add title, whatever. You can even bold it if you want to. It is up to you guys. I might even uh, choose to expand that just a tad bit there like that to make it a little more visible. All right, look at that beautiful graph. Everything looks good. And having said that, you are all set. Now what we're going to do is we are going to, whoops, Click on your graph, go ahead and, whoops, click on your graph here. I'm trying to copy the darn thing. Uh, maybe I'll go up here to copy the graph. Go over here and now paste your graph below. We'll go ahead and paste it and I'll just unlink it. Linking basically just uh, makes it so if you change it in the spreadsheet later, it'll adjust it on here. And you can resize this accordingly, okay? The rule is, when you post a graph or a table, try to keep it on the same page. And if you can't, try to make it as consistent as possible. What we don't want is people that do this, because I've seen people do this before, believe it or not. Make it fit nice and neat and as much spread and presentation as you can get. And maybe we'll even format it down just to give it a little gap there so we can see what's taking place. Okay, that brings us to the next part, the part that everybody loves, statistical analysis. I'm going to let you read this here, but first we're going to look at the null hypothesis and um, the null hypothesis and what we're going to test. A t-test is a statistical test that allows us to see if any two categories are significantly different or not. And so if you recall, what we're ultimately doing is looking at a null hypothesis. Okay. If you recall, the null hypothesis is the default hypothesis. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and compare, let's go ahead and do the first one here and the last one. I want to know, does, if we notice that as a control, does increasing the temperature over the control cause an increase in the reaction rate? That's what we want to know. So a default position is kind of something that you would just assume without any evidence. And in this case, we would just simply say, for our default hypothesis, uh, there will be there will be no difference in reaction rates. Okay, and the alternative hypothesis, of course, is the opposite. There is a significant difference in reaction rates. I'll put all hypothesis here. Okay, what we mean by this, again, is when I compare these two sets of data regarding the temperature of the, ends, of the temperature of the enzymes, there will or will not be a significance. Well, if someone just made that claim to you, you have to assume by default it's going to do nothing. We need evidence in order to believe to the contrary. So what we're going to do is we're going to search to see if we have enough evidence. And essentially what we do is we keep the null hypothesis if... Let's do this. P is, if P is greater than 0 0.05, we keep the null. And if P, the probability, is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null and accept the alternative hypothesis, okay? Now, this can be a little hard to follow along. That's why hopefully this is just kind of review for some of you that are at home or whatnot or need to really go over this over the weekend. The rest of you can kind of skip on through this. But basically, we're going to do a test. If we get anything greater than 0.05, we're going to keep the null hypothesis and conclude there is no difference in reaction rates. 
if we get less than 0.05, then we will reject the null, and our conclusion is there is a significant difference. Let's go ahead and do the t-test, shall we? To do the t-test, you click on a random square like this here, and we're going to go ahead and click equals t-test. Notice it already pulls it up. I'll click on it, and right away it's going to tell us what it wants to do. You can always click on the question mark if you want to see what it is there. But what we have to do is we have to enter it in this format here. Okay? We're going to have to enter a row of data followed by another row. And then we're going to have to enter if it's a two or a one or two tailed test and if it's a uh, paired or unpaired. I will make it simple for now. Just follow me. First one, highlight your first row of data. Just the raw data do not include the mean. We're going to separate with a comma, and now we're going to highlight the next group of data we want to test. Again, separate it with a comma. And now we're going to hit 2, and then we're going to hit 3, because it is a uh, two-tailed test, and it is unpaired data. Again, we will talk about that later. But as long as you got your two rows of data, and you put 2 and 3, go ahead and hit enter. Notice I get a 0 in this case. Or is it really 0? Actually, it's a huge decimal place. I'm going to go ahead and round this up here like this. And in fact, this might be a really small number. Because, I mean, honestly, look at the data here. 73 compared to 15. This is a huge difference. And so if we look at this here, wow, look at that number. We're going to go ahead, by the way, and round this to just two sig figs. And that leaves us with that number. That is a really small number. But think about what it's saying. It is much smaller than 0.05, and this is the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. This is telling us the null hypothesis almost certainly is not correct, and therefore we reject the null and we go for the alternative. Our conclusion in this case is that there is a significant difference between uh, room temperature and 70 degrees Celsius on reaction rates. That is it. A t-test allows us, it gives us the power to make conclusions like these. And that's why we perform a t-test. So I would come in here and answer the questions. What variables are you testing? What would be your null hypothesis? What did you calculate? And what would we conclude? Your final thing here, you're going to go ahead and draw your conclusions. I know that's a lot to cover in the video, but again, I have to kind of make one size fits all since I do have people out. Some people will be gone and for all kinds of reasons. I hope this helps, but we will practice more, but you can always come back to this video for reference. All right, you all have a fantastic weekend. I will talk to you later.